Hi, everyone, and welcome. We're excited um, for this talk today by Leif Richardson, who is one of Xerces conservation biologists and also the California Bumblebee Atlas lead. And we're super excited to have you here this morning, Leif, and thank you everyone for joining us. And I will pass it off to you. Thanks, Rachel. So as you heard, I'm Leif Richardson, and this talk is called Bees at Home, the Natural History of Bumblebee Nesting. And um, when I was thinking about what to present about to you today, uh, it occurred to me that, that uh, most of what most people know about bees comes from observing them on flowers above ground and outside of the nest. Uh, and it's a lot harder to understand what they're doing uh, in the nest, which is usually below ground in total darkness in a place where you could get stung if you were an observer. So, um, so I thought I'd focus a little bit on nesting biology, uh, some of the things that are harder for us to observe about bumblebees. And this will be a talk that tries to connect uh, uh, what goes on in the bumblebee nest uh, across the growing season to the conservation issues that we know that bees are facing. And as an example here, we have uh, Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, both on a flower in springtime, that, that's a queen cast individual, and uh, inside of a captive colony in the lab. As I go through this, you'll see a lot of photos of bumblebees, and I will do my best to tell you the names of these bees uh, so that you can familiarize yourself with them. But in some cases, I'll probably just give you the scientific name as those are the names that are most often used. All right, so I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the Xerces Society. Uh, we are a nonprofit that protects wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. We have a number of conservation focused programs, including those uh, uh, focus on native pollinators, on endangered species, on aquatic invertebrates, on butterflies, and on pesticides. And there is a lot of crosstalk, a lot of interaction, uh, cross pollination, if you will, between and among these, these programs. Um, but our, we are all focused on the same uh, evidence-based conservation work uh, to support invertebrate populations. We also do a lot of community science, sometimes known as citizen science. And uh, this is a place where, where, uh, where non-scientists can get involved with our work and help us to collect data that can help us uh, to protect species that are rare, uh, to improve their habitats and their other conditions. So these include uh, things like our online data platform, Bumblebee Watch, uh, various monarch projects, monarch butterfly projects, including the Thanksgiving counts of these animals. Uh, we have a pond watch program. We track milkweeds also for the monarch butterfly. And we have a freshwater mussel survey program. And there are a number of other community science opportunities at Xerces. So please uh, check out our website if you're interested in, um, in contributing to conservation of invertebrates um, with Xerces. So I will just plug one uh, particular set of, of community science initiatives uh, for you now. This is the one that I lead. It's the California Bumblebee Atlas. Uh, a project of the Xerces Society and a number of partners, most importantly, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the, uh, the idea here is that although California has had a lot of, uh, of invertebrate biologists or entomologists working here for a, uh, quite a long time, we, we've never had a thorough survey of the bumblebees that occur here. At the same time, we know that some of our species are declining and um, at risk of extinction. And so it's very important that we get this basic background data about which bees occur where and how common or rare they are. Um, and to do this best, we need your help. So if you live in California and you're interested in this project, please go to our website and register or contact me directly and I'd be happy to tell you more about it. This is a really fun opportunity to be outside with your friends and family, uh, learning more about an animal that you may uh, know relatively little about. Um, this is just the latest of Xerces' many uh, successful bumblebee atlas projects, including the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas, Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, Missouri, um, and also Minnesota. And you can see a number of our, our uh, colleagues and supporters on the right side of this slide. Uh, and here's a map showing in yellow those Atlas projects. Uh, and in gray, in light gray, you can see some other states are highlighted because they have also had similar 
Bumblebee Atlas inventory projects uh, that were community science initiatives. Uh, there are several other states and provinces on the map that have, have other similar programs, but the point of this map is to, to make the point to you that this work is going on uh, across the continent, and we think it's very important uh, at that scale. And so if you want to join one of these uh, these opportunities, uh, we would love to have your efforts and your, your uh, participation. And lastly, on the subject of my employer, the Xerces Society, I want to just say that we are a 501c3 nonprofit and that donors are uh, essential to the work that we do. So if you're interested in becoming a member or making a donation, please do so. We would greatly appreciate that. And uh, this is a photo of the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, also known as Bombus affinis. It is the first bumblebee that was listed by the uh, US Endangered Species Act as endangered. Um, and it uh, occurs in the Midwestern US and extreme Southern Canada. All right, so first, uh, here's an outline of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time that we're together. I first want to make the case that bumblebees are interesting enough and important enough to uh, be the focus of this conversation. And then I'm going to lead you through the seasonal timing of life history events for bumblebees focused on what goes on below ground or in the nest. So we'll talk about what goes on in spring when, um, when queens emerge from hibernation and found a colony. Uh, what goes on in summer as this colony grows and reaches the point that it's going to start reproducing, start producing uh, male and female offspring that are destined to meet each other uh, or meet others of their species and mate. Uh, and and reproduce and then in, in fall uh, more of that but also uh, what happens when bees um, uh, get to the end of the, the colony cycle and go into hibernation and then of course I'll be talking about how this connects to conservation issues with bumblebees so let's start with the question of why bumblebees and why uh, this focus on nesting biology well first of all as you no doubt know bumblebees are pollinators um, and and just so that we're all on the same page Pollination is, uh, is how plants reproduce. It's the movement of the male gametes, uh, which are specific type of cell to uh, areas of the female uh, parts of the flower. So basically it's pollen moving from where pollen is produced in flowers to female parts of flowers, the stigma, which leads to the style and the ovaries. And uh, this can happen within one flower or between flowers on the same plant or between flowers on different plants. Uh, and so uh, for about 85% of flowering land plants, an animal is required to some extent to make this happen. And the most important group of animals that accomplish pollination is bees. Uh, and so we often refer to them as keystone ecological species. They perform a role that, uh, that is uh, essential to the functioning of the ecological system to which they belong. If you remove those bees or those pollinators, you would see a change in the ecosystem. Uh, but bees are also, and other pollinators are, pollinators are also very important to agriculture. So they're critical to crop production. And we, uh, we know that about 10% of the total economic value of agriculture in the US is due to pollination. Put differently, if we lose bees, if we remove the, uh, the, the function of pollination of crops, um, farmers and uh, commodity producer, producers and, and everybody in the chain from where food is produced to where we eat it would, uh, would make less money and have to pay more for the same food. Uh, more importantly, we would uh, experience a diet that was less nutritious and less colorful and less, um, less tasty uh, without the work of pollinators. Um, and um, surprisingly, uh, it turns out that wild bees are often the most important pollinating group for uh, agricultural crops. So whether or not the Western honeybee, an agricultural animal, is present on the farm, whether or not uh, honeybees are, are doing this, uh, this pollination work from their hives that we move around, um, in most cases, we know that it's wild bees that are doing the majority of that pollination. So uh, this should tell you that bumblebees, as important pollinators and as important crop pollinators, are performing a, a service, we call it an ecosystem service, um, that uh, the that humans really uh, benefit from and indeed we need. So uh, we need to think about uh, bumblebee well-being uh, when we think about what's for dinner. So before moving further, I want to place bumblebees among the other bees so you understand uh, what they're like, how they're similar to bees in general, and how they're different. 
So worldwide, we have more than 20,000 described species of bees. This includes bumblebees, it includes honeybees, of which there are uh, fewer than 10 species, and you probably only know about one of them, uh, Apis mellifera, the western honeybee, the one I was just referring to. Uh, in North America, we have more than 5,000 native bee species. In the U.S., uh, that's just, we have 3,600, the U.S. and Canada combined. Um, and, and bumblebees are not that species rich. So across the whole world, we have only 260, 270, something like that. The taxonomy continues to uh, resolve here. Uh, and, and in North America, we only have about 50 species of bumblebees. So they're not super diverse, uh, biologically diverse, but they are very important functionally, very abundant in many ecosystems. Um, and, uh, but I want, I want to uh, contrast bumblebees with these other bees. So they're actually quite different. They're, they're sort of unusual bees if you were to look at all 20,000 species. And that's because uh, bumblebees are, are social um, and the majority of bees are not. As you know, many species are, but uh, uh, the majority of uh, bee species are solitary, meaning that the, after mating, the female uh, provision, uh, creates a nest, provisions it with nectar and pollen, lays an egg, uh, defends that nest against uh, parasites in some cases, and then leaves and dies without ever meeting her offspring. Uh, by contrast, in a social system, you have uh, numerous generations of bees in, living together and cooperating to rear the offspring of one of those bees. So they're quite different in that way. Also, across the diversity of bees, we know that there are many parasites, uh, species that are parasites of other bees. We also know um, that many of these bees are highly specialized on what they eat. So they can only eat the pollens of certain types of plants whereas bumblebees are noted generalists. They eat many, many different types of pollens and that is, uh, that is uh, something that's actually necessary to, to their health. So think about bumblebees as, as important, ubiquitous uh, creatures, at least in the temperate system, uh, temperate sort of ecosystems where most of us um, uh, live, but uh, they're, they're also unusual relative to other bees and uh, some of which are, are illustrated here to show you the morphological variation that we see. And uh, lastly, we need to just distinguish bumblebees from honeybees. So on the left is a Western, sometimes called European honeybee. And on the right is, uh, is the yellow belted bumblebee, Bombus terricola, the same flowers. Uh, but it, so you see that the bumblebee is a bit larger, uh, darker in color, hairier for the most part. Um, honeybees have those, those distinctive honey colored brown, light brown uh, belts uh, across the abdomen that um, bumblebees generally do not, generally speaking, do not have. Uh, honeybees live in much larger societies, up to 50 to 70,000 individuals in one hive, all directed by uh, the activities of the queen, the single individual queen in the hive. Whereas bumblebee nests can get to uh, upwards of a thousand individuals, but that's rather unusual. They're much more likely to be in the, the low hundreds or even smaller in terms of their size. And their social, uh, their social uh, evolution has not featured such highly complex behavior as in honeybees. For example, the waggle dance that you're no doubt familiar with that helps honeybees to direct their uh, sisters uh, as to where and what direction and how far uh, food resources are located. Bumblebees don't do that. They, they do something less sophisticated to indicate general direction of a food resource. Um, but there are other ways also that, that uh, honeybees are more specialized within the hive and, um, and have more complex social behaviors. So we won't be talking about uh, these, these agricultural animals very much for the rest of the talk. Um, instead, we'll be talking about wild bumblebees. Okay, so moving on to spring when uh, colonies are founded. Um, and this, uh, this recurring slide that you'll see uh, again is the uh, orange belted bumblebee, Bombus ternarius. It's found uh, throughout the northeast uh, part of the continent and is also far found um, in central and western Canada, farther north. So, uh, so, so springtime is when um, when bumblebee, when we could think about bumblebee colony life beginning. And so here I'll take you through the, the full annual cycle uh, briefly for, for colonies. Starting at number one in the bulleted list, as well as in the, the image, you see a, a queen cast bumblebee who has emerged from her hibernation. And her first task is to feed herself nectar and pollen and uh, find a place to nest. Once she's done that, at number two, she initiates the nest 
Um, as I'll say in a minute, she will do this in, an, in a pre-existing cavity, usually underground. You may think of a rodent burrow, for example. Um, she will amass some resources, including a little honey pot full of nectar uh, and some pollen. She'll then uh, lay eggs and uh, incubate those eggs to produce the first uh, adult offspring, which are females who do not reproduce. They're workers, uh, worker cast. Uh, and number three, they take over, fully take over from their mother, all duties of foraging, brood care, other things related to the colony. Uh, later in the summer, the colony switches over from producing successive waves of, or cohorts of worker cast females to producing nothing but uh, but reproductive females, uh, often called gines at this stage, and reproductive males. Males. Um, some people will use the word drone to talk about male bumblebees as we do in honeybees, uh, but usually we just call them males. And then finally, those bees leave the nests, they find each other and mate, the gines feed themselves, and then they enter hibernation. Uh, so the bee in uh, the photo is Bombas vegans um, taking a meal from a blueberry in, in uh, spring, and that's at number one in the cycle. But I want to draw your attention to um, an interesting thing about this annual cycle. First of all, it is an annual cycle. The colony dies off at the end of the season, unlike honeybees. So there's no need to store a lot of food to get through the winter. So there's no honey stored in the winter time that we could avail ourselves of. But notice that uh, that fully something like nine months of this cycle is a social insect, um, uh, sorry, solitary phase of a social insect's life. So it's that single uh, foundress queen who uh, she hibernated just like a solitary bee. She emerged on her own and collected resources and founded a nest like a solitary bee. Um, it's just for the uh, late spring to late summer, early fall period that this is a, a social unit where the queen is directing the behaviors of her offspring, those worker cast females, where there's social, there's communication between generations within the nest. Um, and other sorts of social behaviors. So we are talking about a social animal here in, in when we talk about bumblebee nests, but it's important for you to understand the, just, just how critical those solitary phases are for bumblebees. So we'll be uh, returning to the question of queens a couple of times in this talk. So let's talk about what goes on for queens in early spring. This is a photo of the common eastern bumblebee. Um, these are queens uh, that are emerging from their hibernation in early spring in Vermont. Uh, you see at least three bees in this photo, and that is highly unusual. Uh, bumblebees don't usually hibernate near each other in close proximity to each other, but this species seems to, to like to do so. Um, and I actually know that they're coming out of hibernation because uh, the, the the light colored material in the background is a tent that I've put down over this area where I saw the same bees go into hibernation in September of the previous year. And this is a study where we were catching them coming out of hibernation so that we could study their uh, parasite loads and compare their parasite loads in springtime to the, their parasite loads in the previous fall, basically to understand whether uh, that was one of the factors that caused bees to die while hibernating. Okay, so they emerge from these shallow burrows that they have dug for themselves to hibernate in. They then go out and forage for nectar and pollen to feed themselves. Uh, they look for nest sites, more on that in a minute. Uh, and as I said, this is a solitary phase of life. So the queen is expressing um, solitary behaviors. Uh, when we look at gene expression, we see that the genes related to certain um, solitary activities are, are switched on, whereas genes that might be related to regulating the colony and interacting with others might, might be less active at this time inside the, the bee. Um, these bees are wandering the landscape looking for a place to live. We don't know just how far they move. Uh, there is some evidence that certain bumblebee species may migrate seasonally. Um, there's very little known about this, and I'm not aware of uh, this taking place in any of our North American species, but it's possible. But the point is that there's no central place that the bee has to return to at the end of a foraging bout. So the distance that she could go to find resources could be a little bit bigger than later in the season. So let's talk a little bit about where bumblebees choose to nest. 
in early spring, uh, it's a great time to figure this out, or at least to, uh, to spy on the bees and see what they think would make a good place to live. Um, so at this time, uh, queen cast bumblebees can be pretty furtive. They can uh, be difficult to approach. They're, they're cautious about people. But uh, if you get close to them, you'll see, uh, you'll see the one of the tasks they're performing is, is searching the ground for, uh, for a pre-existing cavity in which to start their nest. And as I said, a rodent burrow is a classic example of a nesting site underground for bumblebees. And I've included a photo of a rodent at the top right to remind myself to tell you that um, uh, bumblebees can't excavate a, uh, an underground cavity of the size that they would need to, uh, to take care of all of their business during the summer. And so they're looking for some cavity that already exists. Um, rock piles like this scree slope in Eastern Oregon on the lower left hand side are places where I have seen bumblebees nest searching. Um, uh, bunch grasses and sedges, for example, in a meadow, like in the bottom right hand corner here where National Wildlife Refuge biologists are searching for nest searching queens. Uh, and, and in uh, the built environment, the anthropogenic environment, including in this case on the upper left hand corner, a beer can that a bumblebee queen was investigating. Um, I saw her go in, it took her a while to come out. Uh, I don't know what happened in there, but she I guess decided it wasn't the best place to live and, and moved on. Uh, but we do see uh, many reports of bumblebees nesting um, in the walls of houses, in, um, in uh, fiberglass insulation, or in the back of a woodshed, in a birdhouse, other sorts of, of things that are constructed by people. And it's important to understand that there, it appears that there's some generalization in some species and many species of bumblebees as to where they nest. So we might see for a particular species that 80% of the nests are reported from below ground and another 20% are reported from uh, sedge hummocks in wetlands or something like this. Uh, so there's a little bit of flexibility built in there. On the other hand, uh, there's a lot of competition that we can we can observe for these nest sites. So we see multiple queens trying to live in the same place. Uh, we sometimes see aggression and uh, we see the signs of aggression. That is, we see dead queens outside of uh, some bumblebee nests indicating that um, that, that they fought over this nest site. I myself have seen up to four dead queens at the entrance of a, of a colony that I was using in a study outdoors. Um, and, and so I couldn't tell for sure which, uh, it, whether the, the first queen was the, the victor at the end of all of that fighting, but um, one of those five queens ended up uh, living in the colony. So this suggests that there may be some limitation on where they can nest. Uh, perhaps it's tied to the abundance of rodents or the abundance of rodent predators or something else about the landscape and, and uh, the propensity for these below ground cavities to develop. Um, but we should think about whether nest sites are limiting to these animals that we know uh, in many cases, uh, there is some signature of, of uh, population decline for. All right, so what do queens eat in spring? Uh, so as I've said several times, queens have to feed themselves immediately upon emerging from hibernation where they uh, subsisted on sh uh, stored resources inside of their bodies. So they, uh, bees can literally starve during hibernation. This is a, uh, not a trivial matter. Once they emerge, they need, to, they need to eat. So they go in search of nectar and pollen um, from the plants that they visit. I've included a couple of uh, popular plants in Northern and uh, Northeastern places on the continent here. So blueberry uh, is, is a popular plant um, for nect both nectar and pollen for spring flying queens, as is willow in the upper end, right hand corner there. Um, this is uh, the, the, the first bumblebee on the, on the blueberry is a cuckoo bumblebee called uh, Bombus fernaldi or flavidus, and we call it fernald's bumblebee. I'll talk more about cuckoos in a minute. Uh, and then we have Bombus borealis, the boreal bumblebee in the upper end, right hand corner. Uh, on the dandelion, we see the, the orange belted bumblebee. And then a, a look inside of a colony where a bumblebee has stored some of these resources, that's Bombus griseocollis. I'm gonna forget the common name for this one at the moment. Uh, brown belted bumblebee, I think we like to call it. Uh, and, and so uh, I wanna just tell you that, um, that in some cases, in some environments where we think there's a problem for bumblebees, we notice that uh, they lack some of these plants, some of the more important plants in springtime. I don't mean to suggest that these three plants are the most important, but uh, early spring pollen and nectar resources can sometimes be limiting on bumblebee colony success. 
And so some of the time when people will ask us how to restore habitats for bumblebees or make them better, um, we'll identify that, that lack of uh, resources in springtime. And the suggestion would then be, you need to add willow to the landscape or you need to plant other particular things that would flower in, in April and May, for example. Uh, sorry, I want to say one more thing about, about the diet here. So we know that uh, in addition to carbohydrates and protein, bees are getting a, a wide array of plant chemicals out of nectar and pollen. And this includes some biologically active molecules that can be both toxic and beneficial in a medicinal sense to bumblebees. Um, if you think about alkaloids like, like nicotine from uh, the flowers of nicotiana or tobacco, uh, it's a naturally occurring um, uh, alkaloid that is found in the leaves of tobacco. Uh, it keeps most insects off of the leaves because it is toxic to them. However, it naturally occurs in the flowers of tobacco where bees are exposed to it. And what we found is that at low doses, this is actually beneficial to bees uh, because those chemicals help um, rid their, their intestinal tracts of a, of a particular type of, of parasite. Um, and so I want to um, tell you that queens at this time of year are also exposed to a whole array of these dietary chemicals, um, some of which probably have negative impacts on them, but some may be beneficial to them. In some unpublished research that I did, uh, I looked at the, uh, the chemicals that are naturally occurring in the nectar of blueberry, looked at just one of these and found that bumblebee queens are quicker to uh, rear the first clutch of offspring in springtime if chlorogenic acid, this one phenolic compound from blueberry nectar and pollen, is present in their diet as compared to bees that had the exact same conditions and diet uh, without the chlorogenic acid. I can't tell you that that's necessarily beneficial, uh, but I, I, I suspect that it is. And the point, the broader point to make is that bees uh, live in a sea of these plant chemicals, and um, we need to think carefully about uh, what those impact, the impacts of those, those chemicals are on the consumers. All right, so uh, getting the nest started. So once the queen has found that spot, she's going to live and she's collected some resources, she'll stay home uh, for the most part, as is the case in this uh, Bombus griseocollis nest that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, once the queen has enough resources, she will incubate those eggs uh, or larva. And as I've told you, these are warm blooded animals. And so they're capable of producing bodily heat by burning calories. Essentially, they are uh, using their flight muscles to generate heat. They're just squeezing two sets of opposing muscles rapidly to generate body heat. They are then moving this body heat uh, in their blood, uh, technically their hemolymph. Uh, they're moving heated hemolymph through the body to warm different parts. And so just like birds, bumblebees have what we could call a brood patch on the underside of the abdomen. This is a largely hairless area where they make contact with the, uh, the eggs or larva and they transmit some heat uh, from their body in that, in that way. So in the upper right-hand corner, you see an infrared image of a bumblebee getting off of a brood clump. The bumblebee is the yellowy white uh, a dot and the reddish and purple is the is that brood clump. And you can see that both of them are warmer than the ambient air, which is the blue area. And uh, the bumblebee has been transferring this heat to her offspring uh, in that way. So before the, the emergence of those, uh, those first offspring, the queen still has to leave the nest to uh, forage. We don't know that much about how long she stays out, how far away she goes, how cold the nest gets in her absence. Um, it's a dicey time when uh, cold weather or um, poor spring conditions can mean that bumblebees have to stay home for uh, uh, you know, maybe five days or something, and uh, they don't store that much food. So this is a time when they can run out of resources uh, and potentially this could impact colony success. So they continue to lay eggs during this time. It takes about four to five weeks for the first set of eggs to develop fully, to go through uh, the various larval stages, then to pupate and to emerge as adults. And they, ad they emerge as those non-reproductive female offspring that we call workers or worker cast bees. And there are only five to 10, maybe to 15 of them in the first clutch. So it's a very small family unit at that time. Um, and oh, I had a little directive to tell you there, uh, what was the brood and what was the queen. Um, it's, uh, it's an early, uh, it's a time when the, the colony is very small. And so it's still a delicate time in terms of interacting with the environment. Um, however, at this time, this is when the queen stops foraging 
as soon as her workers are produced and she stays home and mostly just eats and lays eggs and is cared for by her, her daughters. So let's talk a little bit about one of the really fascinating enemies of these bumblebees. It is actually another group of bumblebees. Uh, we call them cuckoo bumblebees. The scientific name for the subgenus that they occur in is Scytherus. Um, the genus of bumblebees is Bombus, by the way. So Scytherus uh, used to be thought of as uh, some insect other than bumblebees. Uh, and people would refer to the, uh, the other bumblebees as true bumblebees, and this is this one as something different. We now know that, that cuckoo bumblebees are every bit of a bumblebee. Uh, they belong to the same group that includes all of the other bumblebees. They have the same ancestor. Uh, it's just that they have evolved over time. They've lost uh, the, the social behaviors that, they, that bumblebees started with, uh, and they've become parasites of other species of bumblebees, the so-called true bumblebees. So how this works is that the female, I'm not going to call her the queen, but a mated female who is hibernated, uh, will enter the nest of a host in springtime. She overpowers the queen and the workers through a combination of aggression and pheromone um, release. Uh, sometimes she kills them, sometimes she just kind of beats on them and the queen will sometimes, the host queen will sometimes remain alive, but cowering or sort of hiding out under the brood clump. Uh, after this, the, the invader, the cuckoo bumblebee female will destroy the existing eggs and larvae in the nest. She will then lay her own and through the same sort of um, persuasion, she will get the workers to of the host to rear her own offspring. So in this picture, we can see a couple of things about bumblebee nests. Over on the right hand side, we have the, the cuckoo bumblebee female uh, who is entering the nest. She's been in the nest in this case in an experiment for something like uh, four hours, I think. Uh, maybe it was less. Uh, you see the host workers in the upper left hand corner. And then we can see uh, uh, some larva clumps, some uh, a pupa, which is that last phase where the larva matures into um, into the adult animal and then emerges. And you can see some stored honey or nectar in, in this picture in honey pots. So uh, the point to take home here is that these cuckoo bumblebees are very different from other bumblebees. They have a different set of social behaviors. They do not, um, they do not harvest their own pollen and nectar to feed to their offspring. Instead, they invade the nest of another bumblebee. And really importantly, the timing of invasion uh, has some bearing on how successful that invasion will be. So you can imagine that if the, if the female cuckoo invaded a big colony, she would have to face an attack from many workers and she might die. Um, and that is death by stinging and other sorts of aggression. Whereas if she enters a very small colony, she will be able to, to dominate them, but she won't have very many workers to do the actual labor of rearing her offspring. So I, I think that natural selection should probably be pushing on both sides of this equation. Um, and as I'll say in more detail in a minute, we know that the timing of uh, spring for both plants and bees is changing quite a bit due to climate change, climate uh, warming. And um, so it's possible that this is impacting cuckoo bumblebees and this interaction between cuckoos and their hosts. Just one more thing to say for now about this uh, is that uh, across the globe, uh, cuckoo bumblebees are one of the subgroups of bumblebees that tend to be in decline. Wherever we look, we see that, the, that a, a substantial fraction of those bees are of conservation concern. And so we should think carefully about this particular interaction here, the meeting <laughs> um, and everything that, that comes afterwards in, in, in our thinking about what's going wrong for, uh, for cuckoo bumblebees. All right, so let's move on to summer when things really get roaring in the bumblebee colony. And uh, there are successive waves of worker cast offspring that are, that are eclosing or emerging from pupa. The colony grows quickly. Uh, as I said, the queen is now staying home and being taken care of, and the workers are taking care of, uh, of the regulation of the nest, of foraging for nectar and pollen, uh, taking care of the brood, and so I wanted to just highlight a couple of things about regulation of the nest here. This photo is of a tropical lowland species uh, from the Amazon. It's called Bombus transversalis. This is an unusual bumblebee because it does live in the lowland tropics, whereas most bumblebees live in, um, in temperate places, mostly in the northern hemisphere, but also in the southern or in montane places in, in both parts of the globe. 
Um, so this is a, a bee that lives in perennial summer, uh, a wet, dry climate perhaps, and um, the colonies can get quite large and they can live for more than one year. So this is an unusual bumblebee. But I chose this photo because uh, this bee does a lot of what we call thatching. So the, the, the workers are building that big pile of dead plant material as insulation, as, um, as infrastructure for where the, the, uh, the colony will live. And um, all bumblebees do this to a certain extent. You, you may have noticed some dead grasses in the nests uh, of one of the, the bees that I showed previously. So bees collecting dead material and working it into a, a sort of a nest is, is one of those tasks for workers. Uh, they also have to keep the, uh, the, the homeostasis of the nest. So that involves relative humidity as well as, uh, as temperature. And so we see lots of thermoregulation behaviors. We see bumblebee workers incubating the brood we, uh, when it's too cool. We also see them standing at the entrance and fanning with their wings to uh, cool, uh, to air condition the underground space um, when it's too hot. And really importantly, uh, bumblebees produce wax just like honeybees. The wax actually comes from glands on the underside of the abdomen between these, uh, these plates of the body. And when they're really going, uh, you can sometimes see the wax uh, sticking out from between these plates. It just is continually produced and they scrape it off and then form it into the structures that they need. This is energetically expensive and bumblebee workers thus are eating lots of, of honey and, uh, or sorry, nectar and pollen in order to um, allow this to take place. All right, so uh, we need to talk about, um, about reproduction in, in bumblebees. Uh, there's a point in the summer when uh, the queen's, um, the, what's in the queen's best interest probably is not in the worker's best interest. And as I've told you, the queen is in control of the colony for quite some time. However, when, uh, when the colony gets larger, it becomes harder for the queen to control all of those workers. And she's controlling them with pheromones for the most part. So as she ages and her condition lessens, the signal coming from her is less strong. Uh, but there are also many more individuals that she has to tend, she has to be in charge of. And so uh, we often see some conflict uh, that starts to seep in between workers and their mother. And um, we think that one of the explanations for why that happens is that uh, bumblebee workers and bumblebee queens have different imperatives where reproduction is concerned. And so here, this is the most complicated uh, bit of the talk. I'm going to explain to you how uh, the sexes are determined in bumblebees. Um, and it, so it gets complicated in genetics. Um, so bumblebees are haplodiploid, which distinguishes them from, uh, from, let's say, a mammal like humans. We are diploid, right? We have two copies of our chromosomes. We inherited one whole copy from our mom and one from our dad. There's more to it than that, but basically speaking, we got 50% on average of our genes from each of those two parents, and you put them together at the moment of fertilization, and we express traits from both parents in that way, right? Uh, in bees, as in other hymenoptera, the, the larger order of insects to which they, they belong, as well as some other insects um, and other animals, um, they're, they're haplodiploid, which means that female individuals are diploid. They have two copies of each chromosome, one from the mother and one from the father, just like I described for us. Uh, and then uh, males are haploid. So males are the result of an unfertilized egg developing into an adult bee. And in this diagram, you can see uh, that the, the two on the left, we have two female bees that at the top, at the top of the picture, each of them produces sex cells through this process called meiosis. Don't worry about any more detail on that. Um, that takes their diploid uh, genome and splits it in half. So now you have just one copy of each of the genes, one copy of each of the chromosomes in each sex cell, in each egg. And as long as the, qu the, the, the queen fertilizes those eggs with sperm that she has stored in her body from the previous summer, that egg is destined to become a female offspring, whether that be a, a worker cast who does not generally reproduce or a, um, a queen cast or giant cast offspring. Um, by contrast, to make a male bee, the queen just withholds that fertilization and lays a, an egg that's sterile. It hasn't been fertilized. And that develops normally into a male offspring. So there's one more part that makes it really complicated to think about that I'm going to give you now. And it's that word heterozygous. So uh, female uh, haplodiploid insects 
are diploid and they are also heterozygous at the sex determining gene. And so you have to imagine this one uh, gene where there are many different versions. And as long as the female has, she has two versions, she has to have two versions, as long as they're different, in this case, A and B, as in the diagram, then that's a female, a normal, healthy female offspring. If uh, the population is very small, and so the naturally occurring number of different versions of that gene has shrunk, there's a greater chance that a diploid animal is going to be homozygous. It's going to have AA or BB uh, in this diagram. That is, a, um, that is a homozygous diploid, and that does not develop into a female. It actually develops into a male. And interestingly, it develops into a, a sterile male. So these are male offspring. They look like uh, other males, but they cannot produce uh, viable sperm. And they, they, so they um, are a drag on small populations and it can lead to uh, those populations going locally extinct. So let's look at the third bullet down here about average relatedness to worker caste females. This is the part where the, co the competition between queens and their, their, their daughters comes in. So how related is a worker to her mom, the queen? About 50%, just like you're about 50% related to your, each of your parents on average. Um, by contrast, a worker is about 75% related to her sisters, and you are about 50% related to your brothers and sisters. So this means, um, and this is because both, both workers, the two sisters, uh, got 100% of their their male parents' genes, and they got about 50% uh, of their female parents' genes for a combined total of 75% uh, uh, alike. Um, by contrast to that, um, the, the queen's sons, so when the queen decides to make males, um, they're only about 25% related to their worker caste sisters, so not very much. And then uh, I haven't told you this yet, but workers who do not uh, mate with males and do not store sperm, so they cannot produce fertile uh, eggs, they can actually lay eggs. And it, you may have guessed by what I've said so far at this slide, those eggs have to be haploid. They can only have one copy of the genes, uh, one copy of the chromosomes, because in meiosis, the, the uh, genome separates into two. Um, those are uh, eggs that can produce perfectly normal male offspring. And so the worker, uh, the son in that case, is 100% related to his mom, which is one of those workers. So you should be able to see from these figures that for, from the perspective of your worker, uh, the best way to pass on her genes might just be to lay her own eggs and produce her male offspring. She, they're entirely related to her. Um, it doesn't seem like a great deal to, to rear your mom's sons, um, if you had a choice to rear your mom's daughters, if you see what I mean. Um, so we think that evolution pushes on the behaviors of workers in various ways so that um, they may try to, uh, to, to uh, stop being cooperative with their mother and do something that isn't in the best, uh, the best interest of the whole colony, and that is lay their own eggs and, and reproduce. Um, we know that queens can tell the difference between worker eggs and their own, and I have watched queens eating those eggs, so there is some fighting back. Um, but regardless, at the point where the colony decides it's time to make uh, reproductive offspring, we call that the switch point. And uh, at that point, the colony abruptly stops making worker cast offspring, and they turn over to making uh, the ma producing gines, those those reproductive females and and males. Um, I want to just quickly say here that we tend to not talk very much about male bumblebees. Um, their sole purpose in our broader thinking about bumblebees is is to mate with gines and um, they don't seem to do very much else in terms of social behavior or the colony. Uh, but uh, there are uh, some cases where um, we think that males may have imperatives that are at variance with some of the other individuals in the nest. And um, the males do some things in the nest that you might not have expected. So there are several reports of male bumblebees actually incubating eggs or larvae um, in the nest. This is not something that we typically think of male um, in, uh, social insects doing, but, uh, but there are a couple of reports of this. So you can see why that would be beneficial for those males in terms of the, the, the evolutionary fitness of their sisters and their mother. Um, but that's, that's something that we tend to not think uh, is a behavior of males um, uh, of social insects. 
All right, so with that, let's move on to fall and what happens then. So as colonies grow, they start to produce these reproductive offspring, uh, those gines or females that are going to reproduce, and those males, they leave the nest, uh, they, they search for each other, and uh, there are various mate finding strategies. I wanna just highlight one of those for now, and um, it's depicted in the photo at the right. This is uh, Bombus nevadensis or uh, Nevada bumblebee, um, this is a male and he's sitting on uh, on a flower and he's actually sitting in a territory that he has marked with his own uh, special scents. He has run around to each of those flowers and laid down some scent and then he stands on the highest flower and waits uh, for, for uh, queens to come by, for giants to come by. These species that do this have very large eyes and I think you can see that this guy is sort of comically, uh, his head is all eyes. Uh, this is probably because he's got better vision than the average uh, average bee because he's looking for mates. Um, when queen cast, giant cast bees come through that territory, he will attempt to mate with them. In fact, when anything comes through that territory, he will attend, attempt to mate with it or fight with it. So you can throw a little stone past his head and he will fly out and try to grab it. Um, most bumblebees have different behaviors for finding their mates. They may wait at the, the nest entrance or do other things, but I want you to know that, that pheromones play a role and there is some interesting mate location behavior such as what we see with Bombus nevadensis here. Um, regardless, uh, after mating, uh, which is what you see these two common Eastern bumblebees doing, um, that's a queen or giant cast and the much smaller worker behind her. Um, after that, the giants will uh, feed themselves. They'll go out looking to eat and they're storing fat reserves to get themselves through hibernation. This is a uh, Bombus fervidus. Um, uh, I think we, the common name is yellow bumblebee. Um, the third photo to the right, um, she's feeding on linaria, uh, probably drinking nectar there. And then later they will uh, find a place to hibernate. And so the, the bees on the far left are those same common Eastern bumblebees that we, we saw in an early slide emerging from their hibernacula near each other. These are those same bees, maybe not the same individuals, but it's the same site uh, the previous fall. And so each of these bees is digging a little tunnel, maybe two inches deep, just under the, the root zone of the sod and burying herself. And then they then conform to the environment, they hibernate, uh, they don't keep their body temperature high, they, they keep it at the ambient temp, um, and they stay that way till springtime. Um, I want to just stress again, this is the common eastern bumblebee in that photo on the far left. Uh, uh, this communal aggregation hibernation behavior is not typical for bumblebees, and, and so that's just an unusual, interesting little natural history bit for that species. So let's try to connect what we've learned so far about nesting and other aspects of bumblebee ecology to uh, conservation, the issues with bumblebee imperilment and what we can do for them. So as you have probably heard already, uh, bumblebee species around the world are in trouble. We know uh, that in places where bumblebees are well studied, approximately a quarter of all species are at some degree of risk of extinction. So if you look at this wonderful figure from a recent paper uh, that rounds up the, the causes and consequences of bumblebee imperilment worldwide, uh, if you look at North America, you can see the 47 species that they list there. Um, if you just look at the red, orange, and uh, pinkish colors, those are, the, those are the species in the pie chart that are uh, threatened to some degree, and the others are either not threatened or we don't have enough information to say. Uh, and so in certain places like Mesoamerica, nearly half of the species are threatened with extinction. In others, like uh, anywhere in Asia, we, we, we don't know. We don't know enough about the bees that live there at this time to say what fraction of them are in trouble. Um, the numbers in, in some of the countries tell you the number of species that are native there. And so I direct your attention to China, which has 124 native bumblebee species, where the continent of North America has, has uh, around 50 at most. Um, and uh, there's lots that we know about Chinese bumblebees, but there's a lot we don't know yet. And we can't yet say uh, what fraction of those species are, are imperiled, um, but we can say that some of them are, we do know that. And um, so 
I hope this slide will convince you that there's, um, there is a problem going on and um, it's the decline of these bumblebees, but a, an ancillary problem is our lack of understanding about what's going on. And, uh, and um, so let's talk a little bit about who the North American species are that are in trouble. Um, so these, uh, these are 10 species of bumblebees in North America that are, um, that are threatened to some degree. And the scientific names are listed above clockwise from upper left. So from upper left, that's the American bumblebee, then a Morrison's bumblebee, Southern Plains bumblebee is center top, uh, Crotch's bumblebee, Suckley bumblebee, and then bottom right is a variable bumblebee. That's one of that's one of the cuckoos that we've talked about. As is Suckley, by the way. Um, and then uh, second from the right on the bottom is the rusty patch bumblebee. Then the yellow belted bumblebee, Franklin's bumblebee, and finally western bumblebee. So. Uh, some of these guys are still locally common where they occur. Some are exceedingly rare. Uh, as examples, Franklin's bumblebee, the second from the left on the lower rank, uh, that bee has not been seen by people since 2006. Um, variable bumblebee all the way to the right at the bottom, that bee has not been seen by humans in the 21st century, at least not in, uh, in America, North America, north of Mexico. There's Potentially, there are populations in southern Mexico, but that's an open question. Um, so some of these bees may already be extinct. Some of them, we know where to find them with effort, but they are exceedingly rare, or they are only found in a quarter of their former range or something like this. So we have, of those 50 species uh, approximately, we have a substantial fraction that are um, in active decline or critically endangered to the point where they could already be gone and um, and we're, we're we're actively searching for them. Okay, so let's talk about why. Why are bumblebees declining? Well, like so many other insects, uh, we see some worrying signs of population declines, of extinctions, of interaction with environmental stressors that are uh, changing population dynamics. So this is a, a, a picture from a recent publication about something that's been called the insect apocalypse. Uh, uh, so as you probably have heard, there are a number of studies that have come out in the last several years that show that, um, that moths or bees or insects generally, uh, depending on the study, are in steep decline, both in terms of abundance and diversity. And this figure rounds up the many different and interacting stressors that we know affect uh, invertebrates, uh, but, but uh, they, are, they are all important to bumblebees. So I'll just say bumblebees. And I've rounded them up in this bulleted list under four main headings. So climate change impacts are critical. Uh, we see all sorts of, um, of changes in bumblebee distributions as a result of climate change. Uh, bees moving, uh, retreating from the southern extremes of their historical ranges, bees moving upslope on mountain ranges and so on. Um, pesticide exposure and pesticides in, including insecticides, fungicides, rodenticides, um, and herbicides all can cause uh, negative impacts to bumblebees. Uh, pathogens, parasites, diseases, these are really important to declines of bumblebees, at least certain types of bumblebees. Um, most of the bees on the lower half of the previous slide are closely related to each other and we think they may have succumbed to the same uh, pathogen uh, primarily uh, that, that, that it affected that little group of bumblebees different from, differently from other bumblebees. Uh, the fourth thing on this list is habitat loss and fragmentation. Specifically, this could mean loss of nesting sites or, or uh, hibernation sites, but more importantly, we think loss of host plants is a, is a driver of decline for bumblebees. Uh, so this is mostly about native host plants, but um, it's loss in general of flowering habitat uh, due to, de to development, to fires and drought and that sort of thing. It's really important to understand that all of these stressors interact. Uh, for each pair in this group of four, I could give you examples of studies that find some interaction between the pair in terms of driving uh, changes in bumblebee populations. So it's not just one thing, unfortunately. We don't have one tractable uh, challenge to deal with in order to conserve these, these important insects. We have 
uh, we have a death by a thousand cuts kind of situation where there are many interacting stressors uh, that are that are affecting bumblebees. And I have uh, taken that that list of four big things and tried to just identify a couple of more proximate causes of decline for bumblebees obviously related to the first four. So altered phenology, that is the timing of life history events. So the timing of when queens wake up from hibernation, when plants flower, when cuckoo bumblebees attack their hosts, when uh, particular host plants are in flower, when the first frost comes, all of this stuff has changed and changed by weeks in some cases. So we know that bumblebees may, uh, they may experience a dearth of resources that's related to a phenological mismatch, a timing mismatch with their host plants. Um, that's not always the case, but we think that it's possible for some bees in some places. Uh, we know that interactions with, with mutualists and symbionts are disrupted in some cases, um, also potentially due to timing, but other things. We know that bees are suffering from poor nutrition. So when I say they're losing host plants as a result of habitat loss, really what that means is that these bees can't find a, a healthy diet. And so they're, they're, uh, they're more exposed to the negative impacts of, for example, pesticide exposure. And then genetic factors. So I told you earlier that in small populations, we see the presence of these funny diploid individuals who are sterile males as opposed to reproductive females. Um, and so that's among the factors at small population sizes where we know that bees have this other problem. It's just a loss of biological diversity, or sorry, a loss of genetic diversity that might allow them to persist in variable environments and, and um, they may not be able to anymore. All right, so uh, finally, I wanna to try to connect some of these stressors and threats to what we've talked about in terms of nesting biology. Um, and my, my point here is to try to connect the two. I would like you to see that some of the stressors should be thought of in the context of what's going on inside the nest. Not only the, um, that interaction you may have had with a bee when you were out in a meadow and you saw a bee on a flower, such as this uh, queen cast, Bombus affinus or rusty patch bumblebee on, uh, on a goldenrod. Um, it, that's most people's experience of bumblebees, but there's all of this other stuff happening. And so when we think about what to do with the stressors that we've identified, I think we need to remember some of the, the other stuff that's going on in their lives. So as examples, we have climate change, um, and uh, we know that, as I said, some bumblebees and their host plants are, are uh, either emerging or flowering earlier in spring than they used to. Uh, drought caused in part by climate warming um, can also alter when bees are active and when, when and whether plants flower. And this can affect uh, bee nutrition. And this maybe could affect what's going on in terms of um, colony founding and interactions between queens and their daughters. Uh, similarly, habitat loss affects the quantity of a diet. So bees may have um, a more expensive commute to get their food than they had in the past. They may still be able to find resources, but they may have to fly twice as far to get them. Uh, so, so, so collecting food is more energetically expensive. Therefore, the colony may have to grow more slowly, and that could affect interactions among bees in the nest other aspects of life. Uh, plant diversity loss and the use of pesticides such as herbicides should, have, should be expected to be affecting the diet quality for bumblebees. It reduces the number of species of plants they can forage from and uh, means that in some cases their diet is probably less nutritious than it would have been. Um, fragmentation of habitats by development, and fire and other factors could lower population size or effective population size leading to inbreeding and these other sorts of things we've talked about. And finally, drought is a, is a big deal in many parts of um, the world where bumblebees occur. We know uh, one uh, impact of drought on bumblebees is that it, short, it can shorten the colony duration. Uh, the bees can uh, sense the, the lack of resources perhaps and decide it's time to reproduce sooner. Uh, we also know that in colonies that have shorter durations, the sex ratios may be different. Uh, they may produce more males than they would have otherwise. Uh, so a, a more male skewed sex ratio. This can obviously have consequences for, uh, for, for reproduction and population demography going down the road. Um, so, and I'll say that drought can also have impacts on populations the following year. Um, and so these things get complex, but in each case, we should think about how these sort of above ground outdoor stressors that we as humans can perceive and think about are driving or at least influencing some of the behavior 
um, underground that is essential to bumblebees actually reproducing at the end of the day. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And uh, I wanna uh, take questions now, but first I'd like to just uh, direct your attention to these links on this slide. Um, this is where you can get more information about bumblebees and bumblebee nesting. So for example, we have, uh, Xerxes has a nice, uh, a nice post up about bumblebee nesting written by one of my colleagues. It's, it's full of wonderful information and you could learn more um, if you'd like to read there. Uh, if you want to report nests that you have found, so for example, if bumblebees are coming and going from a hole in your porch, uh, if you can take some photos of those bees safely without getting stung, um, we would love to have that as a record of a bumblebee nest. And so you go to Bumblebee Watch and make, a, uh, make yourself a little account and then you post those photos with some other data and that will help us to understand where certain species prefer to nest, whether their nesting preferences might be changing, whether the timing of nest initiation could change, all of these kinds of questions depend on this sort of data. So if you'd like to help us, uh, bumblebeewatch.org is the place to go. As I said earlier, if you want to join one of these inventory efforts that we call atlases, we would love to have your participation. Uh, you can go to xerces.org slash bumblebees uh, you can also go to our community science pages where we where we list those. And finally, this is a new community science project called Queen Quest that uh, you should get involved in if you're interested in what goes on in hibernation. So not the nesting, but what the that Jine does after she goes to bed for the winter. This is a project where volunteers actually dig up a small number of these nests to figure out where they occur, how deep they are, which species use which types of habitats for wintering. Um, this is a, a really fun way to use your, your late fall, early winter time to try, to try to help us understand hibernation in bumblebees. So with that, I'll say thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions you may have.